Sound speeds. We're in a rain delay right now. Now, if you're not in the film industry and don't know what that means, my call time today, which is the time I'm due on set, is 8.30 a.m. My individual pre-call time, which is a time brought in in advance so that way you can get ready, is 8 a.m. But I got here to this location just after 7 a.m. And since then, I've received text messages stating that there are lightning strikes in the area, so we're not allowed to leave shelter. Now, union rules state that if there are lightning strikes within six miles, we're supposed to make all the gear safe, which we haven't even unpacked for the day yet, and we're supposed to sit in a sheltered place until the lightning strikes have been gone for at least half an hour. And considering that we haven't done anything and I've been stuck in my car ever since, I figured might as well record an episode of the Speed Bumps podcast. This is episode three. Let's go ahead and answer our question. This isn't so much of a question, it's more of a topic I'd like to hear your opinions on. I think a video dedicated to shock mounts would be great. Talk about the ones you have, maybe some of the other ones that you don't, but other boom operators do, and what you like and dislike about them. Shock mounts are a great conversation to have with a professional boom operator because they are absolutely critical in what we do. No, it's not the boom pole itself, which we directly handle, but it is something that bridges the gap between the boom pole and the microphone itself. They're absolutely essential to have when you're a boom operator because if you just use a clamp, then there's no resistance to the vibrations that you send as a human that has nerves and has the ability to create vibrations through anything you touch. This is something that's designed for you to hold. So a microphone is not going to differentiate between acoustic vibrations in the air and vibrations that are picked up via your hands. So considering that, you need to have something to kind of bridge that gap in a little bit. And a shock mount is exactly that tool. Now you asked specifically not so much about the shock mounts that, um, you know, in general, but you asked about the ones that I use. Usually I use a Sonella. Sonella, in my opinion, makes the Rolls Royce of shock mounts. They are uh, absolutely solid as a rock. They are designed, though, specifically with one microphone in mind. And, and, and microphones are weighted differently. So they have a – when you put a microphone on a shock mount, it's not one of those things where you could just say, oh, just throw it in there. It's going to be fine. A Sonella is actually made for that particular microphone because of the weight distribution. If I were to have something like this use this tool that you would use to break a window if your car were to flood, if this was a microphone, you see the balance point is maybe right here. If this was a microphone, that would be the balance point. Some microphones would be balanced a little bit farther back with more of a hollow interference tube out front. Some of them might be more like this. So depending on that weight, depending on the thickness, depending on basically the balance in general you're going to have to uh, you're going to have to consider all of those factors and more when you are weighting a microphone inside of a shock mount now a sonella is made with two bows one on the front one on the back and between the balance of those how thick they are how resilient they are to uh to to uh squeezing and that kind of thing those will tell you exactly how it's going to balance the microphone. Sonellas have two different bows on them, one in the front and one in the back. And between the thickness of them and how much springiness they have, it is going to be fine-tuned exactly for one microphone. Sometimes there's a couple of microphones that it will say these are acceptable for, but usually it's for just one is what it's designed for. Now, the reason why Sonella is so good is because they make a microphone shock mount for a particular microphone. If you mix it up and change out uh, the Sedella with the shock, with the actual microphone itself, then it's not going to be balanced pro properly anymore. And it could not be ideal. So when you take a shock mount and you put a microphone in it this way, that's different than it would be if it were pointing downwards, outwards, and whatever. And Sonella has to balance all of those directions to make sure that it's going to be ideal in every way. Now, I use Sonellas. And they have the they have the the regular Sonellas that you would use for an individual microphone. But keep in mind also, Sonellas are not versatile. They're not universal. You can't use them with di different microphones. But what you can is something like an Envision 6 or 7 Lyre from Rycote. And I also love those. Now, what I will usually do is I make a pigtail that goes from the shock mount itself to an XLR tip from Ambient on the bottom. So that way there's a pigtail that's built into the shock mount. That way it kind of adds a... Um, 
I don't want to say a strain relief, but it's kind of what it is also at the same time. And that way, if I if I have a very short little uh, piece of cable coming out of my boom pole, if it's a cable you know, a uh, boom pole, then I can plug it straight into the little pigtail on the shock mount and I don't have to have a whole lot of extra cable I have to manage. So I use Envision 6s and 7s a lot also. Now, those are typically the shock mounts that I use, even though I can use others. There are the ones that come default with your microphones usually if it doesn't come with a clip. Usually I steer clear of those, not because I can't make them work, but because I just don't like the personal way that they balance in my hands. Now, speaking of balance, if you don't have something like a Sinella that puts you, that has you put a microphone in a certain way and you use something like a Rycote or even like the PSC M5 Pro shock mount, which has like two little pieces of metal and there's elastic bands going through there, those are also very effective. And I see a lot of people that swear by those. The reason being is that they'll say that the plastic that's in something like a Sinella or a Rycote, those transmit more uh, vibrations through them than do the elastic bands. Elastic bands can be also modified and dialed in. So the standard ones that it comes with, it may not be ideal for a particular microphone, but people will experiment with, boom operators will particularly experiment with different um, different numbers of and different thicknesses of the elastic band suspensions that are holding it up. I know that a lot of professional boom operators love the broccoli rubber bands that hold together broccoli that you would buy in grocery stores because those will hold a shock mount very, or they will hold a microphone very strongly out the front. And if you add a stronger wind protection to it that's heavier, then you can add another type of rubber band to the front or another broccoli rubber band, and it's going to have more suspension on the front. But you don't want to have too little or too much because it's a balance. If you use a very light microphone and then you put just a very light windscreen on it and it's not balanced correctly, then that shock mount itself is not going to be able to, it's not going to either have too much weight or not enough weight to properly balance. Now you may say it shouldn't be an issue if it's, you know, certain, you know, tension. Well, here's the thing. If it's a very light microphone and you use a very light tension, it's going to be better than it would be a sus suspension wise that it would be if you were using very strong rubber bands. If they were very, very strong, then there's not very much resistance at all. And therefore, if a microphone shakes around, you're going to hear those vibrations transmit through. And just the exact opposite is true also. If you have a heavy microphone combination with a windscreen and you have very little you know, suspension to it, then that's going to bottom out. It's going to hit the bottom of the shock mount and just start making noise. So you don't want to have that happen either. So it's got to be a good balance. Now, some people will say that if you use a Sinella like Osix 3 with an MKH-50, that it bottoms out. I've seen that. And I also, though, will disagree with that whole mentality because in order for it to bottom out, you have to hit it kind of hard. And not just that, it's when the microphone is horizontal. If you go vertical with it, it suspends perfectly fine inside of that. And unless you really try to make the thing bottom out and by slinging it around and making it really hit hard, it's not going to. So that's at least to my experience. Other people may have different experiences, but to me, I always like to follow the, the Sinella recommendation for their shock mount. But with regards to other shock mounts that I also use, I use the Envision 6 and 7s with from Lyre. Um, you know, from Rycote. And then also, also uh, there are times that I have used in the past the M5 Pro PSC shock mount. And I do know a lot of pros that swear by that. There are other shock mounts out there, more universals. Usually I steer clear of those, not because, again, not because I can't use them, but usually because I like to have the things that I like which is why I carry them in my kit. One last note on how I balance my microphones in my shock mounts. If this is a microphone and I'm trying to balance it perfectly, let's just say that I'm using a shock mount that has two little bitty suspensions that are this far apart. You see my balance point right here would be on the microphone. If I were to take that and center it perfectly, right there, that is where I would want those suspensions to hold the microphone. That way it's even on both sides whether it goes up, down, horizontal, vertically, angled out, angled in, whatever the case may be, that is going to be the best possible scenario, in my opinion, for how to properly balance a shock mount. Here's the pro tip I'm going to be offering you in this episode. When it comes to background noises and microphones, your sound mixer is going to pick the microphone that has the dialogue on it that has the lowest possible background noise. Doesn't matter if it's a lav or a boom because they're making a mix track. That mix track is being sent to post for them to make judgment calls on what they want to do and how they want to do it. 
Now, even though they may have the multi-track that tells them this is the boom track, this is the lavs, it's also being used for the dailies. That's where the directors, the DP, the producers, everybody's going to be listening to and looking at that, making calls regarding which take they want to use and how. Usually, they're going to make the call based on picture and not sound. But your sound mixer still wants that background noise to be as low as possible when they produce a mix track for the powers that be. However, as a boom operator, you sometimes have a dilemma. There's a background noise that direction, and it's extremely loud. So the actor is also kind of tipping their head downwards, and you would want to cue that microphone more outwards in order to scoop out their voice because, you know, you're trying to get a microphone in front of them. So what do you do if that is your only option and you can only manipulate the microphone around these axes, and basically you're going to end up pointing that microphone directly at the noise source just a little bit even, in order to properly pull out the dialogue, what do you do? Well, it's actually a no-brainer if you're a pro, if you're a pro, pro boom operator. What you will do is you will pick the best angle that allows you to get the dialogue on axis. If the dialogue is off axis on your microphone, there's nothing Post can do to pull that dialogue back in and rein it in and allow them to fix the axis and pull out that sound in post. But if it is slightly higher in background noise, but on mic, they can do a lot more with their tools to actually pull that dialogue out. The main trick here is what you call breaking the plane. Don't break the plane. And that means that if your microphone is angled out like this, don't start swinging it around because that changes the access drastically. If you pick an angle, try to maintain that same plane where the microphone doesn't change angle, it doesn't change access or anything like that, it will stay the same the whole time. So that way, if a microphone is pointed at someone's mouth and they're tipping their head up and down, the background noise is going to stay, stay consistent relative with the background noise. That's what's going to be helping post the most. Thank you for watching episode three of Speed Bumps. Now, we're still under a lightning strike delay, so I have some phone calls I have to make to my team and figure out what exactly we're doing and how. But regardless, I appreciate you tuning into this episode. And uh, make sure you stay tuned for the next episode because I will be bringing you more answers to your questions and, of course, as always, sound advice. And there you have it. If you would like to ask a sound-related question to be answered in a future episode, you can do that. Just send text, audio, or video to ssp at soundspeeds.com. US. If you want to record the outro, like I'm doing right now, you can do that. There's details in the description below. You can find Alan on social media and online at his website, www.soundspeeds.us. And uh, while you're here, would you please subscribe? Just do him a solid. Hit subscribe, turn on notifications for more sound-related content. Sound Speeds.